Welcome to the Libertarian Counterpoint. I'm Richard Fields. On the program today, we have a couple of writers, a poet and a novelist. We have uh, Philip Rea, the author of two books of poetry, We the People, and part-time Job, and also John Cameron, the author of, uh, well, and, in, and in real life, and in, you know, when he's uh, you know, making money and so, and so forth, you're an investment advisor and the uh, editor of Minute.com. Or, yeah, Minute, Minute Dot. The full-time job. Yeah, the full-time job, yeah, okay. John Cameron is a, a, a development officer at Pacific Legal, Ta- uh, Legal Foundation when he's <laughs> pretending to work, and the rest of the time he is, <laughs> rest of the time he's writing uh, Rewire, Rekill, and the soon-to-be-released, I think, uh, Aristocracy. Yes, yes, would you like to read the end of it now? Have, have you finished the end? Yes. Uh, absolutely, yeah, okay. absolutely, you got to read the Thank end. Thank you, Richard. Because I... Uh, was left hanging when I read the yes, first Yes, I gave draft. him a copy of the book without the ending. Which was just, just re- very difficult to uh, deal with. But, uh, but I, you know, I'll, I'll look forward to reading the ending of, uh, of Aristocracy. Yes. Uh, and uh, don't give it away because I'll, I'll want to read the ending. Okay. Okay. Uh, the uh, de- the uh, uh, We the People is kind of a, a, a reference, I guess, to the uh, Declaration of Independence, I would guess. Correct. Um, our first topic, a picture uh, of uh, Thomas Jefferson on yeah, the cover. So. Our, our first topic uh, in celebration of Thomas Jefferson's 175th birthday early this month. Two. Uh, hmm? Two. Two hundred I'm sorry, 275th birthday earlier this uh, this this month is uh, a uh, an, an analysis of the Declaration of Independence uh, in relationship to modern day issues. And... Uh, Tell us a little bit about that, Philip. How does how does Jefferson and the and the Declaration relate to what's going on in the country today? You know, it's fair to say that Jefferson would be turning in his grave. Uh, virtually every word of that Declaration has been in some way rescinded or abridged since, in some really crucial ways. Um, and the one that always catches me uh, is, um, you know, he didn't write it. John Locke wrote the deathless prose that we all know, uh, that all men are created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights uh, among these life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which was originally written as the pursuit of property. And it is that word today that interests me most, pursuit. There's no reason to believe that Jefferson did not mean that word literally, as well as uh, metaphorically in terms of pursuing one's Uh, passion. He meant literally mobility. And when you think of um, how this country was developed, people in wagons, people getting up and going, things didn't go well for you in this town, you got up and left and there was no restriction on that. Now we literally can't leave our neighborhoods. And so one of the most corrosive um, influences in our society is the need for a, a, a permission to pursue. How do you mean you can't leave our neighborhood? Well, you, when you think about the idea of that you must apply for a driver's license uh-huh. and renew that, uh, you pay the property tax on your car every year. In which case, if you don't, you're, the right to pursue is denied you. Think about, um, you know, there was a spate of police killings. Um, you mean uh, killings by police or killings killing of by police? police okay. Killings by police primarily. Right. Okay. Uh, but sometimes of police. Uh, and all of them were, are, there were literally over a thousand deaths around a traffic stop. Now, if that traffic stop doesn't exist, everybody's still alive. So we have used this whole construct of, you know, having that license as really an excuse to target people we mean to target. Of course, it's clear that, you know, we have jokes about driving while black and those kinds of things. Well, it is clear we're targeting people, uh, whether they're, it may not be an ethnicity, it may be a, a wealth factor. If you have a, a lousy car, you get tagged. And if you get tagged, you don't escape that. Uh, it just keeps building and building and building. Jerry Brown recognized that a couple of years ago. He said, look, we're gonna stop putting people in prison for uh, unpaid traffic fines. So you, you can't imagine how destructive it is to people trying to get on their feet uh, to have this annual tax and the threat of literally losing your livelihood. If you can't get to work, if you're stopped and your car's been impounded, that kind of thing, 
that it is, uh, it's incredibly damaging to our society. Um, you know, what could we do? We could have once, a, once in your lifetime, you prove that you know how to drive a car, you, you know, uh, got the rules, great, you're issued it for life. Now they're leveraging the license to uh, travel. TSA, every in 2020, all driver's license have to be the sort of TSA approved sort of thing. So, so that the 17 uh, intelligence agencies at the federal level can keep better track of you. Precisely. Uh, so of all of the things that we think about in terms of um, what has been abridged that was the most damaging, I would argue that it was that one word that we gave up the inalienable right to mobility. And it has been the most damaging influence. And this is recent. This is when we think about this, uh, when the Model T came out, you know, a decade, nobody got a license. Uh, and so this was a bureaucracy built to keep tabs on people and to deny them something that was essential to their life. Uh, well, a license is nothing more than government taking away your rights and selling them back to you. Exactly. And when you take away, if, is it inalienable or isn't it? Was it endowed by government or was it endowed by your creator, whoever that might be? Uh, and so when you take a, when you look at that word, if there was one thing I'd say, well, you know, this is, uh, uh, apart from uh, the income tax amendment and apart from the Federal Reserve, the travesty on our society of, of having to ask for permission and pay for it every year to pursue is um, the most damaging to Jefferson's declaration. I find it, I find it interesting that the list of grievances that uh, Jefferson included in the uh, I was wondering who was gonna get to that. Independence is uh, very uh, apropos to what's going on in the country today. Uh, one of his grievances was uh, the uh, grievance that uh, the king was preventing the encouraging of migrations hither. The king was making it very difficult for people to emigrate to the New World. Does that sound familiar <laughs> in, the but, age, but in the age of Trump, preventing or uh, the, discouraging the, king, the, the king emigration? The king now wears a hat that says, make America great again. But yes. the thing about that is, is it's never been, uh, there's always been a gentleman's agreement that immigration, and this is among Democrats and Republicans, especially I would say Democrats, um, you know, because they was the party of racism, frankly, with Woodrow Wilson and the Roosevelt's, uh, that uh, immigration is illegal, but we'll let you come in and do, a, and be undocumented status so that we can essentially use you as slave labor. We do that in California. And we say, hey, look, we're going to wink and nod at it, but any time we want to deport you, we can do it. Yeah. Obama was known as the deporter in chief. Yeah. So there has never there there has never been uh, whether with a Republican or Democrat in the office, it has always been that we use immigration, uh, really since the Progressive Era. Well, yeah, you have to uh, make that proviso because before the progress Progressive Era, there was no restriction exactly. on immigration whatsoever up until. Mm -hmm. The first uh, restriction on immigration was preventing, uh, w was aimed at Chinese who had been in imported to uh, do uh, grunt work in building uh, building out the uh, uh, gold mines right. during yeah. the uh, the uh, gold rush. Mm -hmm. uh, so it was like the 1870s when they were still here and competing for jobs. That's when the first racist uh, anti-Chinese immigration laws were passed, and then it was at, you know uh, different well, you saw it. undesirable, you saw it uh, you know so-called undesirable. Uh, ethnicities were added as time got, time uh, went by. At one time, it was the Irish. Yeah, one so time no it was the Irish, Irish need apply. Because now it's now unless you're European, the, yeah. unless you're Northern yeah. European or, or European, forget about it. If you're a Mexican, there is no way in hell that you can actually come here legally. It's just not, uh, it's just not practically possible. Same way well, with most South Americans. If you're a software engineer, you can. You not, can not come on an H one B Not not necessarily. Yeah. Even even the high tech people are being uh, being stunned, uh, you know, stopped at the border anymore. So, preventing migrations hither is one of the biggest crimes of both Democrats and Republicans. This is bipartisan. I mean, uh, Trump made a is, is making a, a big deal out of it, appealing to the you know to the, uh, the, the the nativists and the people who who operate on fear of their jobs being taken. But he is very much emblematic of the uh, act you know, the actual actions of both parties. 
And the sad fact is that immigration is the best thing we have going for us. We talk about Social Security being in danger. Well, the reason it's in danger is largely, not entirely, but largely demographic. Mm -hmm. People my age and older, uh, there's a lot of us. People uh, in the millennial. Older, uh, than, older than you, Richard? Yeah, people in the uh, millennial age group uh, who are in the money earning, Social Security tax paying group, not as many of them. And so you end up with, you know, with a pay as you go program, you end up with not enough people paying and too many people taking. Immigrants would solve that problem, or a large part of it. And well, they have for, for generations. Yeah, it's but been not anymore. Not anymore if uh, Trump gets his way. Yeah. And, and it's not just Trump. It's the Democrats sign on to it as well. Uh, another thing that uh, Jefferson complained about is the king has cut off trade with all parts of the world. Again, sound familiar? <laughs> I've got to say there, I've got, I'll be the uh, devil's advocate on this. Um, we have had a, uh, what this is all about are, is the trade deficit, and it's massive. And not that it's, it's all trade imaginary deficit money. deficit is meaningless. Exactly. But, but the point is, is that the reason that deficit happens is because uh, there are very high tariffs on our goods going to certain countries, uh, Japan specifically with the automobile, uh, certainly China, certainly Canada, and Mexico. Which and allows, and low tariffs coming the other way, which, allow, which works in favor of American consumers. We pay <coughs> a lot less because we're not being charged the high tariffs that Japanese and Chinese citizens are going in the opposite direction. The American consumer benefits, there's a slight uh, competitive disadvantage to American producers, but they make up for it in, in countries, you know, in other countries around the world. Well, we this still is, compete. But it creates the incentive to, uh, for, for American producers to both do whatever it is that they do overseas and import it back into the U.S. And of course, what that comes down to is jobs. So if, um, you know, the big one, the big one was uh, steel. And uh, in the case of steel in China, it is a national industry that they don't know how to stop because there are so many jobs. Uh, they, they know they're mass producing steel and they can't stop it because it's so important to their economy. So we put a, 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 a tariff or whatever, uh, 20, 25% tariff or whatever Correct. it is on steel, and we help out the steel industry, but the steel fabricators, the people who actually use steel, lose multitudes of jobs more because they, their, their raw materials just went up in price. It's a lose-lose game whenever we start going into uh, a competitive tit-for-tat trade tariff, heart, ta tar 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 kind of uh, trade war. We lose. Well, Everybody Jefferson, else does Jefferson um, well. actually, uh, you know, that the only tariff that he uh, imposed was on Great Britain because Great Britain had a tariff on us uh, at the time. Mm -hmm. So well, Jeff Jefferson, as as Jefferson believed that it should be whatever it is, whatever you're doing to us, we'll do it to you. Yeah, well, that, that was uh, Jefferson as president. Right. And there was Jefferson, uh, for all of his uh, flowery and uh, inspiring rhetoric, was a bit of a hypocrite when he became president. He bought the Louisiana Purchase, which then worked out okay, but <laughs> it, was not, it was not necessarily uh, something that uh, uh, was, I, I don't know if you could really justify it on a libertarian basis. Uh, the, the only, the story there, I was thinking about that earlier as before the show, um, uh, context of history, Aaron Burr had just tried to cut the country in half by taking over the uh, Mississippi from Canada to Louisiana, to right through to the Gulf of Mexico. And they had foiled the plot. Jefferson went out a year later and bought the whole thing. Yeah. So, you know, we could have fought a war over it. I mean, that inevitably would have happened. But instead, he said, hey, you know, Napoleon, uh, you, you don't want this stuff anyway. You, you know, you're trying to get Russia. Uh, and so, you know, he bought it. Yeah. It's not a bad way to go. Yeah, well, if you believe in government <laughs> ownership of property. But by, by the same token, it was all sold and homesteaded, so it all ended up in private hands, or mostly ended up in private hands. Unlike today, anyway. when, when anything pretty much west of the Mississippi and the, and, and is my, owned And my by favorite the complaint government. of the declaration was that the uh, king is keeping standing armies in times of, uh, uh, keeping, kept among us in times of peace, standing armies. Mm -hmm. We're doing exactly the same thing, except that the standing armies are not only just standing, but they're also getting involved in foreign wars, civil wars, other countries that we have absolutely no interest in who wins. Well, and there's a great story, uh, John Adams' administration, and uh, he felt that, the whole country felt that um, the French were on the verge of invading. 
Uh, there was no doubt about it, and hue and cry. Uh, states were building ships, warships, and sending them to the federal government. And at, with great reluctance, Adams says, okay, we must have an army. And he went to Washington, and Washington said, I'm you know, too old, I'll be the commander in chief, but I'm too old to be out in the field, so you know, you've gotta let me pick who's gonna be out in the field. And it was Alexander Hamilton. Adams and all of the founding fathers despised Hamilton. They, For uh, good reason. Ad Adams uh, wrote in his uh, letters that despite he considered the him the American history. Bonaparte. Despite the Broadway musical. Yeah, he yeah, he was true. the worst of the worst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Our first tr true criminal. Uh, and uh, and Michael it just Jackson so happened that that, mm -hmm. was when, um, that was when Nelson defeated the French and Spanish fe fleet, destroyed the chance that France would uh, invade America, and immediately Adams dismissed the army and dismissed Hamilton. And, uh, you know, Jefferson absolutely opposed the standing army, and we did for many years until we got into the, you know, conquest phase. But the, but the, the, uh, the, the final thing that I want to mention about the Declaration of Independence, which libertarians and everybody should remember, everybody who is uh, feeling a little bit put upon by government, is that we have the right to alter or abolish a government that is not meeting our needs. Well, yeah. I'll just leave it at that. If you yeah. look at if you look at the list of grievances that the uh, founding fathers were facing with England, mm -hmm. and let's say you're uh, an entrepreneur in California, the the list of grievances you would have would be a, a another power higher compared to what people faced. As far as standing army, you have a standing army of regulatory thugs who are armed and can throw you in jail. You have uh, all the federal regulations and everything else. So when you say standing army, we, we picture federal forces. But if you add all the state, local, county yeah. forces yeah. and all the uh, armed thugs, I, I think the Forest Service has right. a SWAT team. Yeah, so I, I, yeah. I forgot to mention the, one of the other complaints was that the king had sent uh, multitudes of agents to harass our people and eat out their substance. Yeah. Mm. And that's exactly what's happening now with the regulatory yeah. administrative state. Mm. Well, and from an economic Among standpoint, other. people don't realize that 50% of what they earn is being bled away. Uh, yeah. You know, it starts out with the income tax and people think about that, but uh, when you tax, think about security tax, sales payroll tax, 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 uh, tax uh, yeah. various, various fees and, re you know, that kind of thing. Um, and at the end of the day, you look at what your gross was and you look at what your net is, and, you know, the grocery bag tax, you know, yeah. you can go the, the, the bottle tax, uh, you, the with taxes tax embedded in yeah. gasoline. Yeah. Um, so when you look at that, you know, there's a reason that so many people have left the workforce. And we have a, nat a natural transition to our next uh, topic, which is taxes. I once did this show on an April 15th, and I was nude from the waist up. And my line was, the IRS has just stolen the shirt off my back. <laughs> um, I'm, think, I'm glad that it was a, a show that was recorded before we went on deep air, uh, rather than after. Nobody can watch it. I can talk <laughs> about it. Actually, I'll sell you the tape. I'm research I'll, I'll research that, that Richard. It doesn't <laughs> exist. Uh, but uh, it's, you know, w w Democrats and Republicans complain about the deficit when they're out of office and uh, expand it when they're in office. That's true for both Democrats and Republicans. It has been for decades now. And the most that they can do is say, well, we're going to, you know, we're going to chip away at waste, fraud, and mismanagement, which of course is a is significant, but an insignificant part of the, of the actual deficit. Uh, I actually sat down and took a look at the budget numbers, and, and we had a $666 billion deficit in 2017. And I came up very quickly with a way to balance the budget with no problem at all by cutting 700 some uh, billion dollars in uh, spending cut half of defense spending, and we could cut a lot more, but I'll just settle for half, and we mm -hmm. save $360 billion, something like that. And then add uh, cutting the Department of uh, Defense, cutting the Department of Agriculture. I'm not, uh, by cutting, I mean eliminate the, de the, uh, the Department of a a Agriculture, eliminate housing and urban development. Why do we need to be subsidizing farmers? Why do we need to be subs subsidizing house builders? And the Department of Education, all it does is get in the way of local school districts and private schools doing their job. And the Department of Energy, why are we subsidizing big oil? 
and the Department of uh, uh, all of the science spending? Why are we subsidizing big pharma and big tech? There's no reason for any of that spending at the fe federal level. When you get to over $700 billion in tax cuts, which is enough to balance the budget and chip away su substantially at the federal income tax. Well, and you know, the irony of it is, is that, um, you know, you, you allude to it from time to time, is that it's all, um, it's all just concept, it's not real. Uh, between 2010 and 2014, the Federal Reserve simply printed all of the discretionary budget of the federal government. Well, yeah. The yeah. entirety of it. Yeah, well, what that, so it's what just that ultimately a, turns into is either passing it on to our, 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 our descendants or inflation, one or the other, or both. Well, uh, you know, that's, a, that's what really has the Fed buffalo now because they can't find inflation. And so it turns out it looks like they can do all of that, well, but, inflation, but, but in a it's, world it's of asset fiat inflation. Curve, well, it is what uh, the fact is is that without s demand, um, supply yeah, uh, gets it, cheaper. It, it's asset inflation, stock market and the bond market keep going sure. up. And what does that do? It, 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 it widens the gap between rich and poor, which right. means it's the people who have money that can borrow money to participate in the stock market That's boom. Right. They get richer, the poor. But that, that not percentage is so small exactly. that the, the broadest the population is getting poorer, as we all acknowledge. The time. So what, what the Fed printing money does is it widens the gap between rich and poor and gives the socialists something more to fight yes. about. Yes, and so but that's the why the Fed, the you know, the Fed right now, uh, among, exactly. among yeah. the you know, financial people, yeah. you know, they, you ask them what the greatest threat well, to the economy yeah. is or what the greatest threat to any, uh, uh, to business, it's the Fed. Uh, it's not China trade. It's not any of the issues. Everyone right now is focused on the Fed. And, 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 and we should not be, you know, equal opportunity. It's the Fed. It's the Bank of Japan. It's the, uh, sure. the you know, the whoever prints the euro. Uh, and, and the, you know, ultimately IMF and, uh, and the other uh, uh, world organizations. Well, they will come out with special drawing rights to bail everybody out at some point. And, and the thing, and since it's all a gentleman's agreement now, not tied to any hard assets, uh, you know, um, it is not to Japan's advantage or China's advantage or anyone else's advantage to uh, to have a strong currency themselves or to, you know, uh, Upset create the cart. And, and so what happens is, is it's meaningless. It is it, it's all imaginary. And I, also, I, I will ask the question, so people will say, well, the U.S. is $20 trillion in debt. Who is it in debt to? Every other country, every other major well, it's a, it's economy debt, is also a debtor country. Yeah, so it's in debt to who, who, to whom does this money go? It's all on the Fed balance sheet. It's, it's all us. It's all on the Fed balance sheet. Every time we buy a bond. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And so the fact is, the odd thing is, is that what the Fed is doing is penalizing the average American for having loaned the government money. And so, so when we raise when when the Republicans say, "Hey, you know, we've got to rein in Social Security because of the deficit or what have you," what they're really saying is, "We need to tax you because we borrowed money from you, and the only way we can pay you back is to tax you." May I read what's on a 1957 um, silver certificate? You have one. Uh, in silver, redeemable to the bearer on demand. You think if I hold went to, to the, if I, to it's that. worth a whole buck, a check. But, yeah. but you know, 50 years from now, it might be worth two bucks. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, and I bought it for a dollar yeah. after checking to make sure I wasn't ripping the person off that yeah. I was buying it from because I had no idea. Yeah. What, what would happen if I showed up with this in hand and, and asked for my silver? Nothing. No? Yeah. Yeah. Well, silver's not actually terribly... Um, expensive right now, well, so no, you're all right. It's worth more than that. If it was gold, you, you'd have another value, but. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so uh, again, but all it, fiat it currency forever. I mean, there there's never been a society that has lived through fiat currency. And but meantime, uh, we are so. arguing about things like Facebook, whether it's good, evil, or somewhere in between. Which is it, or is it, or does it really even make any difference? Are you looking at me for I'm that? I'm looking for anybody that has. I'll jump in and I'll say it's it's uh, good and evil. The thing about uh, uh, Tonstoffel, th there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. So all these free services, Google, um, Facebook, you know, Twitter, everything else, they have to make money somewhere, and they either make and money. And they're making a lot of money by by you know 
publishing ads that uh, clickbait to attract you to do something, or, or they make money from data. And that uh, data is only evil if it benefits someone you hate. And <laughs> so um, it, it was good when Obama used the same kind of evil data to get elected in 2008, and he was, he was uh, talked about as a genius of social media. But since when, uh, when the evil orange man Trump used it, it was evil. So it really depends on who's in power and who controls the lamestream press. So I'd say anytime you use a free service, just, just you have to know that it's not free. Remember, you are the product. Yes, you are the product, you're what you click on, all the rest of that. I've chosen to go with another search engine rather than, than Google because of that. Who, who, who do you use? DuckDuckGo. Duck, yeah. duck, duck, they, they, they don't harvest your data. They don't harvest also, your data. They are based in the U.S. There are also other search engines that are based outside the country. They mm -hmm. can uh, add another layer of privacy. Well, and, you know, Facebook, like any other business, has taken a huge hit for uh, alienating about half the population uh, during the last election when they became partisan. Mm -hmm. And that well, when Facebook well, sort they of became changed. obviously partisan. Exactly. Well, and Google has done the same thing, which yeah. is one but of the reasons an economic effect, I'm not using you know? it as a search engine because the, a search engine has value only if it yields the search that you're looking for. And, and they've and been manipulating the searches for quite some time. And, uh, and it's become more and more and more obvious. Where it became obvious to people, even people who aren't very discerning, was prior to the last election. And the example I always use is uh, I put in Hillary Clinton LI. And the, what came up on Google was library. <laughs> Which begs the question of how could that happen? <laughs> and that's the question we'll leave you with tonight for the, I don't know, latest episode of Libertarian Counterpoint on the TV at Channel 17 in Sacramento, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on the web at accesssacramento.org, Channel 17. Thank you very much for being part of the show. We'll see you again next week. Thank you for having us on, Richard. I appreciate it.